Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to the uh, Nanka Judo Yudashakai's Jigoro Kano and Judo, The Secret Behind the Man. And we're featuring Lance Gatling. Uh, Lance is a, a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel who has lived in Japan for over 35 years. Uh, he holds uh, Kodokan Judo Sandan, uh, Nihon Jujitsu Kodan Renshi. Wow. Uh, director and instructor at U.S. Embassy Judo Club in Tokyo. Uh, he is also a Judo and martial arts author and lecturer. And he's going to be lecturing today, it looks like. Uh, researcher of Jigoro Kano for over 15 years. Uh, he is on the board of Tokyo Judo Federation. And today's uh, event and uh, presentation will be uh, Colonel Gatlin, and he will be joined by international renowned, renowned judo experts, uh, Dr. Hayward Nishioka and Dr. Michael Callan. Uh, Dr. Nishioka is a Kudan, ninth dan in judo. Uh, he also holds black belt in karate and kendo. Uh, he's a retired professor of kinesiology and health. Uh, started judo classes at UCLA uh, and Los Angeles City College. An accomplished competitor placing uh, fifth place in the world championships twice, uh, gold medal at Pan American Judo Championships, US national champion multiple times, uh, too many times to put on paper, and also a US national grand champion. Um, he uh, served uh, as a United States national head coach uh, past president of Nanka Judo Inc., uh, past president of Southern California Collegiate uh, Judo Association, and past president of Nanka Judo Yudan Um He is an international A referee. Uh, some of the major events uh, officiated are World Military Games, World University Games, Pan American Games, Kano Cup, Fukuoka Cup, and several European Open tournaments. Uh, he has written many books, just too many to list here. It'll take a couple hours to uh, name them. But anyway, uh, all are uh, must-have books in your judo library. Um, I have most of them, by the way. Uh, and over 150 articles published in various magazines, plus 35 videos. Um, he is honored by being named the Kodokan Kinshu Sei. Uh, demonstrated Nagano Kata at the 1962 All American, uh, I'm sorry, All Japan Championships. Uh, he has been inducted into the United States Judo Federation Hall of Fame, uh, USA Judo Hall of Fame, and Black Ball Hall of Fame. Now, uh, Dr. Michael Callan uh, is from uh, UK. He holds uh, seventh down in Judo, uh, associate professor at University of Hertfordshire in Department of Psychology, Sports, and Geography. Um, he, had, he is the head of the I Dojo International Judo Research Unit. Uh, Dr. Callan also has written and published many books relating to science and history of judo development. Uh, he has published over 50 academic papers, including several on judo history. Uh, he founded the Bowen History of Judo Archive in the UK, uh, has ex extensive experience of providing coaching educations around the world. He is the president of the International Association of Judo Researchers, uh, education director of Commonwealth Judo Association, and managing director of Judo Space Educational Institute. Wow. Um, he has worked in the International Federation Service Team for Judo at the London uh, 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games and Tokyo 2020 Ju uh, Olympic Games. Uh, his PhD relates to support for Judo players in an educational environment, awarded the International, uh, International Judo Federation Special Award for his service to education and research. Now, um, after uh, uh, Colonel does uh, his uh, uh, presentation, we'll do two, uh, have a panel discussion with the uh, uh, doc, two doctors, and we'll do Q&A session after that. Uh, if you wish to uh, ask questions, 
Uh, please do so in the, the chat, is it? Is that what we're gonna do, Mike? Yes. Okay, so, and here's, uh, I'm gonna turn the speaker over to Colonel Lansing, uh, Lance Gatling, uh, Judo Kano, Jigoro Kano and Judo, secret behind the man. It's all yours, Colonel. Okay. I believe everyone should have a full screen of a cover page here. Uh, the title of this uh, presentation went back and forth for a little bit. Um, I had made a presentation to the American Philosophical Association regarding the origins of Kano Shihan's Judo philosophy. Um, and for me, it was a highly academic paper, uh, not necessarily for anybody else, but it was meant to be uh, an academic paper. And uh, I presented it to a bunch of philosophy professionals with the hope of getting some feedback uh, regarding the, uh, the research and my conclusions. Uh, it turned out that some of these uh, folks mentioned are so obscure these days that there was really uh, essentially no feedback from these nice folks who let me into their professional organization in order to do this. Uh, but it was educational in, in many ways to do so. So I started with this presentation, and I, I expect that there are a lot of advanced uh, judo instructors here. So when I was asked by uh, Keith Chu and the folks at Nanka to make this presentation, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the student who comes into you and says, I want to learn judo. And you say, well, OK, we're going to do the basics here for uh, a year or two or three or four, and then you'll get into this. And they said, well, that's fine, but I want to do uh, Yoko Stemiwaza today. Um, so, so we went back and forth a bit on the, uh, the actual title and what I would present, uh, which is fine. And what I've done is a uh, basis on this original presentation regarding the, the development and historical significance of Kano Jigoro's judo philosophy, uh, and then added some other bits that might be of interest to judo folks. Um, as I was introduced, I'm a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel. I was, uh, an operations and armored cavalry officer with a specialization in Northeast Asia. So I learned Japanese professionally for almost three years full time and then have continued studying Japanese uh, every day since then. So what, what happened was that I became interested in the, in the history of judo. I started judo at a relatively late age in life despite uh, playing around with judo a bit at West Point uh, many, many years ago when I was a cadet. And then starting again some 30, uh, over 30 years ago, um, and ended up in a kind of a splinter organization of judo, uh, which is a long tail in and of itself uh, regarding the development of martial arts in Japan. But some of the judo history didn't make much sense uh, to me as a trained intelligence analyst uh, for the Defense Intelligence Agency and multiple uh academic credentials that were basically in support of that and we weren't looking for um, new policy we were we were tasked to find facts that supported uh, the policy makers and the decision makers so the judo history in and of itself sometimes didn't make sense then i went to to read the history of kano shihan and there are big pieces that didn't make sense and then how Kano Shihan fit into Japan, and part of that uh, as portrayed in the post-war biographies didn't make much sense. Uh, so I kept reading and, and discarding, and finally went to source materials, all pre-war Japanese, which means it's almost a different language in many ways. A lot of modern Japanese won't bother to even try to read it. Um, so I have this massive collection of papers from Kano that haven't been uh, cataloged before. Um, aided by the internet and, and spending uh, months and months at the uh, National Library. So there are hints and trails all over the place, uh, and I'll, I'll put a few hints down during the presentation and see if anybody catches them. I'm not a trained historian. Like I said, I was trained as a defense intelligence analyst, um, and I had the tools to do some basic historic research. But if someone asked, have you considered the Hegelian Marxist dialogue regarding cisgender, whatever. My answer is likely to be either uh, no or huh, uh, because I didn't do any of that. Uh, what I do is collect facts as I can find them and demonstrate them. And I, I do hope in fact to spur on more uh, serious historical 
research regarding Kano and his role in Japan, which is nothing, I think, uh, compared to, uh, to the histories, I think is much greater, much broader. Uh, so here's, here's young Kano and his elder brother uh, around 1870. And there are hints, even in this pic simple pictures like this, that his life was not uh, normal at the time. Now, this is the front piece for the original presentation that I gave to the American Philosophical Association. And here's Mr. Kano himself. This is a formal portrait. Um, you, you can tell by certain accoutrements he's wearing. I don't know the specific occasion, uh, but most people have misdescribed his role from the very beginning. They have it, uh, they have it wrong. They, they have him as simply a headmaster principal of a Tokyo Higher Normal School. He was in fact, one of the top uh, three to five bureaucrats in the Ministry of Education and had a role much, much broader than simply a, a, a high school principal, which is usually the description uh, afforded him by uh, modern biographies. Uh, the way I did this was read a whole bunch of stuff in English and Japanese, um, and that continues today. So what is judo? Let's start with the definition of judo. And I put this in English because Kano spoke e excellent English. He, he uh, studied English from a very early age uh, and was trained in the, in the school that qualified interpreters and bureaucrats who were gonna negotiate with the, um, with the foreigners who were flooding in Japan when he was a young man. Uh, so he was professionally taught to be a linguist, and this is the way he described it late in life, 1932, so he's 72 years old, and he's actually in Los Angeles. Uh, the occasion is the uh, Los Angeles Olympics, and he says it is literally the way of flexibility. Now, I've translated it's flexibility. He uses flexibility, um, and he goes back and forth saying softness, gentleness but, gentleness, but I think that flexibility is really what he was driving at, uh, and I have another paper or two that describes why that's the case, looking at the original Chinese philosophy documents. But more importantly, he describes judo as a study and training in mind and body, as, as well as the regulation of one's life and affairs. This, he meant this as an all-encompassing philosophy. This is a lifestyle to him. This was a, a life-driving uh, decision to adopt judo and become uh, a better person. Uh, and we'll see what that means. And now, for some reason, okay. But why does anyone care about what Kano thought? It wasn't just that he was uh, the founder of judo. He happened to be born in the moment when the Japan was being born itself. He was in the second graduating class at the University of Tokyo, which was established for the purpose of educating the people who would be the leaders of Japan. When I first came to Japan, everybody talked about you know, Toda. University of Tokyo is such a big deal. And oh, you know, these people are, are so smart and everything else. And I thought it was overblown until I realized that that is in fact why the university was developed. It was consciously uh, staffed and then uh, students were recruited, tested, got in, and they were expected to lead the new Japan. And in fact, uh, Kano and his classmates uh, and subordinates and uh, peers did. For example, uh, the first test that Kano took is a 16, 17 year old. He sat at the same desk as Kato Takaaki, who later became a prime minister, and they knew each other for life from the time they were 16 years old. Um, the people that he associated with sometimes hired, he hired Takano Sasaburo, who essentially uh, defined modern kendo. Uh, Nito, uh, Nitobe Inazo worked for him, so did Uchimura Kanzo. All of these are very famous people in their own right, novelists, historians, culturalists. And in essence, they define the new Japan in many ways, education, language, literally the language spoken today in Japan was chosen by Kano and some of his contemporaries. Uh, what it would be, how it would be spelled, how it would be, uh, which kanji would be used and everything else. Uh, they define history, literature, imperial Shinto philosophy, teaism, teaism is the, uh, the, the wabi-sabi, the simplistic uh, culture of Japan. Uh, the, the, the culture of Japan that tends towards austerism and everything else. All of this was not developed over hundreds and hundreds of years. It was consciously uh, developed by a handful of people, almost every single one of which was a Kano contemporary, compatriot, colleague, or subordinate.
So some of the contributions that Kano made included his own judo philosophy. Now, this is actually his writing, and you can always tell if you, if you look closely and know uh, what they mean by the pen name. I, I assume you can see my uh, cursor. Uh, the pen name, the left hand, the stamps, uh, and the signature. So this is the final form of what became his judo philosophy, Serio Kuzenyo Jita Kyoe, which is uh, usually translated as maximum efficiency and mutual welfare and benefit. But I ask a lot of people here who should have known, and no one could tell me the origins of these sayings. Or is it a saying, or is it multiple sayings, or what is it? What exactly is it? He uses the term uh, genle, which, which means the philosophy uh, or, or, or origin philosophy, perhaps is a better term. Uh, so here's a partial list of his positions, which uh, uh, I won't bore you with. You can see these later. I guess this is being recorded, will be made available. Uh, but the point is, he's an extraordinarily busy person. He wasn't just hanging out at school and then going to teach judo. Uh, he was an incredibly busy person, and this is only probably uh, a quarter of the actual positions that he held. These are probably the more well-known positions and uh, larger organizations that had more impact on Japanese culture, but he was also a member of many, many, many other organizations. Uh, I still find him today after 15 years of looking, I'll find uh, an obscure organization for cultural affairs or Chinese connections or whatever, and Kano would... Kano Shihan would be a member, founding member, or board member um, in it all the time. And for example, I, I realized that he and some friends had contributed an entire library to, the, to be established in the city of New York as a psychological operation trying to counter the anti-Asian sentiment in uh, California. Um, and this is a pure psychological operations, advertising, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that library was funded for about three to five years. It ran out of money, and then they negotiated that it became the core of Columbia University's Asian, East Asian Library, which is one of the most renowned in the world. So Kano was born in 1860 to a commoner sake brewer family. This becomes important in later in life as Kano is not, uh, in fact, beholden to any of the daimyo, any of the, of the big names, the former feudal masters. Um, the area of uh, what is now Kobe, where the Kano family thrived, was in fact run by a bugyo, a, di a direct uh, bureaucratic uh, administrator sent from the Bakufu, the central uh, government in Tokyo because of the tax and the population of uh, nearby Osaka and the taxes afforded them by sake. Sake is a huge issue in, in uh, Edo era Japan. It provides over 50% of the tax revenues up, up until about 1912, 1915. It still provided up to one third of the cash tax revenues of the entire country. So sake brewers were held in great esteem. They were very wealthy people. Um, Kano's personal family came from uh, folks who had established an almost 400-year-old uh, Kiku Masamune, and Hakusuru was split off from that. Kano and his brother and his, his large family were actually in a third offshoot, which is another story that's kind of interesting, perhaps. <laughs> but he was a privileged youth. His father was a very educated man and paid for Kano to a as a young child, as, as a jinnosuke, to attend private tutor, uh, to be tutored in the Chinese classics. So he began, he started reading these books when he was seven. And there, that is a traditional method of education, not only of culture, the law, uh, but also how to write, how to read uh, Chinese, uh, which was the written language of the day. Remember that at this time, it's still 1867, 1868 becomes the, the first year of the Meiji Restoration. Uh, so he starts very early on studying the Chinese classics. But when he goes to the University of Tokyo, he's in the second class. He mat uh, matriculates with the second class, graduates in 1881. So he's there from 1877, 1881. And he is in a a very small group. It's less than 10 people. I can't, uh, the, the exact numbers seem to vary according to who reports it, but no more than 10 or 12 graduates, 1882. And he's reading uh, Jeremy Bentham's John Stuart Mill and Herbert Spencer in the original English. All of these classes were taught in English by Americans um, and uh, English uh, teachers who were hired by the Bakufu at incredible expense. So the 
the actual national budget spent most of its budget on paying these uh, foreign instructors. And as quickly as possible, they turned it over to Japanese, which is much uh, less expensive. There's one man who, whose role in uh, judo history, I think, is under, misunderstood com or completely overlooked, is Munakara uh, Itsuro, who was an educator. He had also gone to the Kano Juku, his private school. He, had, he went to the, the schools where Kano uh, was one of the instructors or headmaster. So he was about the only person on the Kodokan staff who matched Kano's education. After he retires, he goes to the, uh, to the Kodokan and spends the rest of his life working on judo. Um, he had a uh, full professional academic career around the country where he uh, pro promulgated Buddha, uh, judo. Uh, but in his memoirs, it is written that uh, Kano, Shian, uh, Kano Sensei had taught British rationalist thought along with a feeling of the Chinese classics. So what does that mean? A feeling of the Chinese, let's start with the bottom, a feeling of the Chinese classics. In all of Kano's writings, what I see is uh, a, a lot of Confucian themes uh, and Taoist themes. So when Kano talks about ethics and uh, ethics of the family and morality, he talks about the five relationships. Now, under Imperial Japan and the emperor system, the, the relationship between man and heaven is actually uh, substituted out for the relationship between man and the emperor. But other than that, it's pretty much standard Confucianism. Uh, the, the continual stress of self-improvement is very confusion. Uh, the direction of humanity's role under heaven, under heaven also, once again, uh, during the imperial period, uh, swapping out heaven for the emperor. And man, man owes responsibility towards society. It has a proper place in society. But on the Taoist side of it, you can see the uh, implications of this in much of the judo uh, writings of Kano Shihan and other people that, that judo defeats force by yielding. Uh, intuition plays a very key role and uh, mostly that's overlooked by people today who are more interested in techniques and uh, cultivating some bizarre uh, counter to, uh, to an attack. Uh, but the Taoist themes are don't fight, uh, don't use strength, be flexible, cultivate your spirit, and all of this is in harmony with the way. So you have these ancient Chinese themes that are interwoven with very modern at the time, bear in mind, this is in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, where Kano Xi'an and his folks are developing Juno, um, very much modern themes. So one of the most uh, influential Western uh, philosophers at the time was a gentleman named Herbert Spencer. Now, he was alive during Kano's time, so um, he was only in his 40s and 50s when Kano was working out uh, these things. He was actually the man who, term, who coined the term the survival of the fittest. He was a contemporary of I just lost, <laughs> I just lost the name. Someone uh, typed me the, uh, oh, Darwin, sorry. He, he and Darwin. Charles Darwin. Were, Thank you very much. <laughs> I knew it in Japanese, Darwin. So um, he was actually a contemporary of Darwin, and they kind of played Mutt and Jeff regarding natural evolution, selection of the, you know, natural selection, uh, the progress of the species and all that. And Spencer is actually the one who coined the term survival of the fittest. It wasn't Darwin. So Japan underwent what was called a Spencer boom. He became a very popular figure. People were reading, uh, learning English in order to read his books. And uh, almost every single one of his writings was eventually uh, translated. Okay. But he stressed the scientific approach. And this is a very interesting man, self-taught man. Um, and he was so famous that Mori Arinori, who, was, who spent most of his uh, life overseas studying uh, became a uh, charge of sort of the Japanese legation to London and tracked down Herbert Spencer and established a, a personal relationship, um, corresponded regularly. And Moriari Nori goes back to Japan and becomes the first minister of education. Now, he had, he had been the magistrate of education before, but this is the first cabinet established. Uh, Moriari Nori becomes, who's a Kagoshima man, I believe, uh, Takeda-san. Um, he becomes uh, a, not only a close personal friend of Spencer, but he adopts Spencer's ethics and is charged with establishing 
Japan's first ethics text in 1887, 1888. And this is almost unknown in judo history. I, I actually had to find some Chinese records to, to understand how this worked. Um, and I just found the Kampo, the, uh, na the government journal, the daily journal that, that assigned Kano to this task in May of 1887. So there's a five-man uh, compilation editing crew uh, committee that answers to Mori, and Kano is the youngest member. He's the only member from outside the Ministry of Education. Everybody else works for the Ministry of Education. And what they come up with is called the Rinni Show, the ethics text. And there's a, there's a much longer Japanese subtitle that essentially says it's for the use of middle and uh, higher school teachers to uh, teach ethics. And it adheres very closely to Spencer's Principles of Ethics, which had been printed and uh, published, self-published by Spencer in 1879, later published commercially, uh, was uh, in Japan, in the library, uh, University of Tokyo, taught as a text. And Spencer goes and makes a great deal out of the cooperation of self and others. It says that this is what drives society forward, that people have egotism where they work for themselves, and then they work for the community. And you have to have a balance between those. The cooperation of self and others is a reasonable balance between uh, looking out for yourself and altruistic behavior, which looks out for others. And, uh, and he goes into it in great detail, but he has a term he uses time and again. Uh, this is translated into Japanese, um, but then in the actual test, they translate it as, uh, as Jita Heiritsu, which means you and uh, you and others standing abreast in cooperation is the is the implication. And then later I find a very obscure uh, reference that Kano adopted this, and his version was Jita Kyoe. Okay, so Kano himself never said that he invented the judo philosophy. He mentions one time that I can find. I'm still looking for uh, other confirmation that it's not his. That he adopted it from quote unquote, another Japanese. After the British utilitarians, and I just gave his lecture in Japanese to the uh, Japan Academy of Martial Arts and, and created a lot of interest because um, apparently no Japanese had ever made these connections. But there's a German physical chemist, uh, Nobel Prize winner, named Wilhelm Ostwald. Now, Ostwald is in Germany at the University of Leipzig when Kano Shihan is in Berlin, based primarily in Berlin on his almost year and a half long trip, uh, which I went into the uh, Imperial Archives to research and found a bunch of information regarding that that nobody's ever seen. Um, so Kano is in Germany, and you have to bear in mind that Kano, uh, young Kano Shihan, fancies himself to be quite a philosopher. He's a founding member of the Japanese Philosophical Institute. His first writings in 1887, his first published writings are all about the English uh, utilitarians and uh, the philosophy of uh, utilitarianism and logic, uh, introducing that to the Japanese public for the first time that I can tell. Uh, and they're quite lengthy and they're really hard to read. Um, it, for anybody, much less uh, some poor guy like me, but um, it, it demonstrates his distinct interest in it even before he went to Germany. So it's very uh, likely also that Kano roomed in Berlin with a bunch of other German students. Now, Kano was not a student. He was on a uh, government mission to do a whole lot of other things. He in fact um, probably roomed with some German uh, German-speaking Japanese chemistry students because Japan got most of its original uh, chemistry technology from what then was the leading uh, chemistry uh, industrial power in the world, which was Germany. So it, it may well be, and I'm still looking for an exact confirmation of who was there uh, at the same place. There are some bits and stories, mostly uh, humorous anecdotes about Kano pulling jokes on the landlady and everything else. Uh, that are very human, uh, very interesting on a human level, but don't explain it. But Oswald was starting to give public lectures on what he called energetic, the energism. 
And, it, and the question was, at the time, it was a very serious philosophical question, which now people, uh, we're, we've actually come full circle. The question is matter made of energy, waves of energy, or uh, in, individual atoms. Well, now that we know more about quantum physics, we think it's kind of one of both. And the argument was um, perhaps too simplistic. But Oswald was a proponent of the energy theory, and he did a, 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 an incredible amount of work with Ernst Mach, which the Japanese call Maha. Uh, Ernst Mach on how energy works. And as a physical chemist, it's uh, important to understand the uh, energy valences of different chemicals and everything else. Remember, he, this guy essentially invented physical chemistry and understood energy very well. But there were no experiments that said atoms are actually the thing of which uh, matter is made at the time. When that was proven, he had moved on and, and developed energism as a monistic, which means single unified uh, all explaining uh, philosophy and a scientific, scientific universal philosophy. And in part of that, he says, self-realization is the supreme goal of humanity. That is why we're here to be self-realized. And what that means is not just do what you want to do. It means fulfill your potential as a human being. And so, and this was very well understood by Japanese chemists. But there is a, a fascinating guy named Kuroiwa Ruiko, who is uh, essentially running the uh, pink tabloid version of a Japanese magazine. He was the most widely hated person in Japan by anybody in power because he went after corruption and uh, people having affairs uh, uh, while married. And, and this is a kind of daily tabloid sheet. But he had a collection of essays in which he had gotten interested in energism and uh, translates in energism as seiryoku. And if you look here in the, uh, the katakana that's here, it actually says in energism, which he translates seiryoku shugi, uh, seiryokuism, energism. Okay. So this is the first time in 1904 he, he presents this to the Japanese general public. So to cut to the chase of the original study, what I did was compare and compressed uh, energism as, pro as promoted by its most uh, influential adherent, which was, in fact, Oswald, and compare that with Kano Seiryoku Zenyo. It's universal, it's very scientific. Uh, the, the point of living is to become uh, a self-realized human. And Kano said that was about in, individual perfection, physically, intellectual, and morally to be capable of benefiting society. Uh, Oswald went into the supreme good. What is that? Uh, it's, it's efficient exercise of normal human faculties. You're not trying to become Superman. You're trying to do the, the normal human things that, that you do, but do them in the best way possible, benefit yourself and the most people. Uh, and then this is a quote out of a Kano document uh, translated by me. Okay, so Oswald said, do not waste energy. And Kano termed that as the best use of energy. And one of the criticisms that Kano got later in life was that he was a utilitarian. Um, and it wasn't a secret to anybody at the time. But he actually wrote in the, in the founding documents of the Kodokan Bunka uh, Culture Society that the goals of the society were as one with ut uh, utilitarianism. Okay? And this was later used against him in a board uh, revolution, a board revolt that almost threw him out of the Kodokan. If you can imagine that, uh, at the time, of course, the imperialists and the militarists were saying the, the best use of energy is doing whatever the, you're told to do on behalf of the emperor. And Kano was very careful after that to thread the needle to to walk a fine line between promoting a, a universal uh, monistic philosophy and the imperial philosophy and that that distinction almost got him thrown out of his own organization uh, which is a pretty interesting side story now these are the conclusions i came to the to the paper that in fact he adopted uh these two separate judo philosophy sayings from uh, Western philosophers. And, and I, I'm welcome to have anybody find evidence that uh, counters this, but everything fits. I can't find anything that doesn't fit. 
even though Kano himself never says exactly that, uh, there are hints at it in some of his close associates and what he writes. Uh, it's not his invention. He uh, did, in fact, adopt it from someone else Japanese, but those Japanese turn out to be guys that, that actually adopted it from Westerners. But his writing do include elements of classic Chinese thought, particularly Confucianism and Taoism, uh, more often written Tao these days. But those very elements helped to obscure the origins as people looked, and uh, a lot of very well-intentioned and very well-educated Western judoka have tr tried to find Zen elements and everything else. And one of the more interesting things I found recently is that Kano essentially says that following his, uh, his judo philosophy is sort of a Zen shortcut, that you can sit in a corner and you can meditate for decades and get to a certain point in your understanding of yourself and the universe, or you can get out and do judo, come out much physically better uh, equipped to handle life and get to the same moral and physical plane, a moral and spiritual plane as, as that Zen study uh, and not have to sit in the corner. So I, I'm sure that there is additional research to be done, which I continue to today, perhaps uh, somewhere in Kano's unpublished di English diary even, uh, there's some uh, detail that might be helpful. And I plan to finish writing about this in, uh, in a longer manuscript that you can find on my website here. Uh, so that's it for the philosophy side of this. Okay, the next part is the, uh, is, is the other things that uh, the Nanka folks thought might be of interest. Um, and let's go through that quickly. I think the, we're better served by the panel discussion than hearing me rattle on about this because you can read the, the presentation. I'll probably make this entire presentation available on my website down here, okay? So people always ask, what, uh, what Kano thought of sport judo? And the short answer, I think, really is that to, to Kano Shihan, judo is not a sport. So the very term sport judo is like, uh, I, I, I fail to find a uh, politically acceptable term. It just doesn't make sense. It's like, you, you know, how can you have your cake and eat it too? You can't. It doesn't exist. The, the two terms are mutually exclusive. Judo to him was, was in fact a regulation of one's life and affairs. He meant it to be used in all things. You think about it constantly. Uh, you start in the dojo, physical dojo, we'll discuss that in a minute, physical judo, and you progress to trying to apply those uh, tenets of judo philosophy to the world. And, and one thing that I always tell folks, and I'm sure that uh, Bill Caldwell and his folks have heard it a hundred times, uh, he wrote that Kimi no Kata is a core of judo. So I'm always bemused by people who say that judo is too passive. It's not a, it's not a, like a martial art or anything where Kano Shihan in all of his writings talks about from the very beginning, every single time he talks about attack and defense. And he doesn't mean just getting shoved around. He means if someone throws a, a swing at you, you should be able to uh, control them, take their balance and break their arm if that's what you want to do, because that's how he thought it should be taught. Uh, there's a quote that uh, I won't take uh, too, too literally. The, the first part is probably correct. After a judo tournament, he said, you guys look like young animals out there pawing at each other. This is not what judo is about. So he, he did, in fact, think that randori was important. And he did, in fact, that shiai were appropriate at, at, at period, periodic intervals. But he did not except that you had to release all of the judo tenets in order to win. In fact, the, the, the one saying that he wrote the most uh, is actually talking about sticking with the way and you, you win by adhering to the way of judo, even if you lose the match. And that's how you win in judo. So. Uh, I think they're completely different things, and he was very skeptical uh, uh, skeptical of having judo given to the broader world to throw up as a tournament um, as a tournament uh, sport type uh, activity. He he saw it as completely something else. 
one of the questions was Kano Shihan on education, and this uh, calligraphy kind of encompasses it. And this is, I think, uh, this is an original translation. So the point of him, uh, the point for him was that education would allow you to teach one person, and that person might go forward to teach other people, thousands of people, and in that effort would reverberate throughout history, teaching morality. And his very specific morality is uh, sitting in plain sight in, um, in many of his writings and, and speeches. He didn't start this way. Uh, if you read his autobiographical uh, biographical interviews uh, from, the, from the 20s in Judo Magazine, he talks about having been interested in both uh, religion as a religious instructor and as a politician. And what I found out, he actually uh, was drafted to run for the diet at one point uh, earlier in his life. Uh, he, was, he was shoved out by some very sharp elbowed, uh, more astute politicians. He never ran for office again, but he was approached by one of his own students who was the chief cabinet uh, counselor. And he was imperially nominated as a member of the upper house, which is a lifetime appointment. And he actually had a very interesting career as an upper house member, which is almost completely ignored by uh, Westerners and even Japanese who don't know or don't care about the uh, activities in the upper house. At the time when Japan was gearing up for war, if, if, for example, he was the vice chairman of the finance committee and was personally courted by any number of the militarists and industrialists to make sure that they got the funding for the war machine. One of the things I found was Judo's 12 Precepts. It was written in 1930 in a very obscure book um, this is a short, a, a brief translation. I have a much more thorough translation. It doesn't change the overall tenor. It does change some of the details. I hope this is readable. It's pretty small print, uh, but it builds up from the experience uh, as first it, judo as judo shugyo, shugyo being the austere practice, the dedicated practice uh, as budo. So he goes from Budo to physical exercise and, and admonishes people that you should be just as careful in your normal day kata and randori as if you're dealing with a live sword, uh, which is a Japanese term for life or death. Uh, you don't screw around with a live sword, it can kill you. So therefore this is a very uh, important uh, admonition. And that the study of the uh, objective of Judo study is to improve every day, not to win or lose. And then drops this hint that judo practice is not limited to the dojo. At the next level is physical exercise. Um, he was a great adherent to scientific exercise. And most people don't realize this. Uh, in the very earliest uh, magazines that he edited and had published in the late 18, uh, mid to late 1890s, he actually advertised uh, Sandow's method, which is one of the first scientific weightlifting regimes in history uh, by, uh, I believe was, he was an Englishman, um, Sandow, and he's a bodybuilder, he was a very famous worldwide, but in coming into Japan, essentially, uh, Kano Shian and his people had some sort of monopoly on, on his book, so they had him translated, um, published them, um, and then every single magazine for months and months of the Kokushi uh, Patriot magazine that Kano Shihan published had the Sandow method. Uh, and they would, you could send them money and they'd send you a Japanese translation of this weight training. So, you know, there's this, this notion that uh, traditional judo uh, didn't use weights, but Kano Shihan in the 1890s is advising people to use weights in a scientific fashion. And also um, to have proper food, sleep, rest, uh, all things in moderation. The, the next level is Judo Shugyo as spiritual training. And this is where it comes in. It, to, it, he would call it spiritual training. And today we might call it character training instead of spiritual. Uh, but how to, how to conduct uh, Kata and Randoi, always giving your best. Uh, this is uh, 
an aspect that I found very interesting uh, and repeated uh, that you endeavor to practice not with just judgment, but also with intuition. Uh, and, and the way you practice your intuition was to practice a lot. So you had instant responses that you could come up with uh responses to attacks but also to con consider how other people reacted to you while you were practicing and then taking judo outside of the dojo and you see the the common thread here is of course uh, everything goes back to serio Pazinho, jita kyoe uh, and you he admonishes the judo practitioners to adhere to Seiryu Kuzinyo, Jita Kyoe, everyday life, uh, in every single instance, stop. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nishioka and I have had an interesting conversation on a particular saying of Kano, and I, and I finally think that uh, he jarred me to actually look at this the correct way, and I think I have an explanation that uh, may be unique. Maybe we'll get to it later. One of the other things I was asked about was the styles of judo. Uh, in, a, in a long forgotten book in the back of a library, I found a lecture from an unnamed Kodokan uh, member in the 1940s, and he talks about the, five, uh, the four eras of judo, and I added the fifth. Uh, early Kodokan ju judo was, in fact, jujitsu. There was no judo. Kano Shian himself writes it around 1887 that technically judo was complete. But it's clear from the record that uh, it, it may have been complete, but they didn't complete the curriculum until into the 20th century. So he spent decades working through jujitsu, and he had um, Ikubo of uh, Kitoryu coming regularly to teach and other other guest jujitsu instructors. Um, so the so the mythology uh, that Kano Shian started teaching judo at 22 simply isn't borne out. Um, and also, it's very interesting from a from a historical record standpoint. There's almost nothing in writing about the 1880s uh, Kodokan. It's very, very little. Um, the first books don't come out until 1900, so there's at least you know 18 years that it's undocumented. And when they first come out, they're actually by students of Kano, not by Kano Shiha himself. So what they come up with is a school curriculum judo it made judo acceptable to. The Ministry of Education. Now, bear in mind that Kano is inside the Ministry of Education as a very high-ranked bureaucrat, and he can't get the Ministry of Education to agree to include judo in the standard curriculum of, of the uh, Japanese education system. So he and his senior students and instructors work up the way to actually uh, make that acceptable to the Ministry of Education. He sees that as a great uh, victory, and as his plan is to have everyone in Japan doing judo and then eventually the whole world. Uh, Kosen judo and the Neiwaza that comes up from that actually had a tremendous impact on the, on the Kodokan, uh, not only technically, but, but also very much politically and organizationally as uh, splinter organizations formed for the first time. People got away from Kodokan judo and made essentially made their own organizations of judo in order to do what they wanted to do. Uh, for a number of reasons, wartime judo has been uh, either forgotten or intentionally obscured uh, characteristics. Now, this is after Kano dies, but the pressures were there, and they were in some ways showing up even before he died in May of 1938, because the Sino-Japanese War was escalating very rapidly, um, and there are a whole lot of complex reasons. Uh, and and at some, at some level, it's clear that these were intentionally uh, left out of post-war judo histories. I'll put it that way. Uh, for example, this, this right-hand chart, that's a judo class with the two young men. They're not even wearing, not only are they not wearing geese, they're not even wearing tasuke, which allows you to do judo without, uh, without a uh, keikogi. They're outside, they're in a mass organization. And it, and it very much looks like uh, a simplified form of karate or hand-to-hand -hand combat, which it in fact is. And then post-war in the occupation, I actually got into the occupation records and found uh, the reasons that the Kodokan changed judo into what it was. There was a meeting held between a bunch of senior people and a uh, US Army representative, and they sat down and discussed what judo could do. 
under the occupation and how it would happen. And also there were Kendo people. I think there was a Naginata uh, representative or two. And the upshot of it was, we don't care what you do, but you're not gonna do what you did. And, they, and the Japanese being pretty practical and, and not quite understanding what the American was saying, ask, what does that mean? He goes, well, do something else. Why don't you turn it into a sport? And from that conversation came a whole bunch of uh, other activities that uh, oops, are in fact reverberating throughout judo history, even today. So that's a very simple way. I, I expect that our time is better spent with the panel than with me rattling on. Uh, if you want to see more of this, uh, check into the Kano Chronicles, sign up, and we'll send you a notice when I uh, post more things. I have uh, scores more tales that I can't disclose quite yet because, because it's either not the right timing or I don't have full uh, documentation that would um, encourage me to do that, but it's coming soon. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll turn it back over to Osugi Sensei. Oh, wow. That was uh, very interesting, uh, Carl. Thank you very much. It puts a lot of things into perspective and uh, coming up with a lot of uh, questions as well. But uh, I'd like to, at this time, invite the uh, panelists to uh, join you, Carl, and kind of discuss uh, what they felt the, of the presentation. So is uh, uh, Dr. Collin and Dr. Nishoka. Of your picture. Hello. Oh. Can, can you hear? Oh, Glenn. What do you think? What did you think of the uh, presentation? You know, before we even start, I have to really thank Lance for coming on and and giving us an awful lot of information, a lot of good ideas and a lot of questions, of course, come up at the same time. And these are some of the things that we'll probably be discussing today uh, in our discussion uh, with Mike and uh, with Lance. Uh, I think uh, Kenji's going to start out with some some questions for Lance first. I think, huh? Yeah. Before before I ask the questions, I, I just like to get uh, you know uh, Dr. Nishoka uh, just uh, spoke a little bit, but um, Dr. Allen. Uh, what was your impression of the presentation? Well, I mean, you know, um, Lance's research is is remarkable. Uh, I've been involved in judo research for for a number of years, and 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 the rigor that he applies uh, is is really quite remarkable. Um, and uh, you know, he he, he kind of. Uh, blithely kind of rolls off his tongue that you know probably nobody knows this or probably this has been hidden for years and the, and the reality is that he's right Be, you know he, he's uncovering information which is which is uh, if it wasn't for him would be completely lost so uh, you know I commend, I commend my, uh, Lance on his work and uh, yeah the presentation lived up to uh, what I was expecting really quite remarkable. For myself, uh, and this is for both Mike and for Lance, uh, I really appreciate you both. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the, this is a question to the panel. Um, there was an impact on judo due to World War II. Uh, what does the panel think was the nature of that impact? And do you think that it had positive or negative effect? What was that? Should I say it again? One more time. So this uh, question is for the panel, the three of you. Uh, there was an impact on judo due to World War II. What does the panel think was the nature of the impact? And do you think that it had positive or ne negative effect? Nishioka Sensei, please. Uh... You can start off, Mike. Right? Um, okay. Uh, I think it, it's more about the um, the changes that were created post-war for me. 
I mean, Lance's information is fascinating uh, uh, about some of the uh, kind of more militaristic activities that were going on during the war. But uh, I, I think the, um, you know, the influence of GHQ on on the Kodokan and, and the Kodokan having to be flexible, which I think is, is there's an irony there. Um, but, uh, you know, flexing uh, judo to, to meet the environment um it is really really interesting um and and i think uh that that was key to the internationalization and the popularization of judo around the world um so i, th I think i think um judo would not be the same if it hadn't been for, for the horrors of, of world war ii and the and the influence of ghq on on the kodokan for myself i think uh I think the war was a critical juncture for us. It's a it's a time of uh, of confusion. It's a time of not knowing which way things are going to go. And in our world today, most of us that are doing judo think of it as a sport. But with Lance's uh, uh, presentation, you can see. It is more than a sport, and we have to maintain that kind of mentality uh, if judo is to really survive, at least in the United States, uh, because that's what we're all about. We're about making a better person. When you look at uh, when you look at international judo today, it is exemplified by the competitor competing in the Olympics. That didn't come about until the 1960s, 1964 uh, was the time when they changed over and said, this is a world uh, event. It's a judo event and it became part of the Olympics. But if you really look at what Kano's idea was, was more than just uh, as, as a sport. Of course, of course, we honor those people because they, uh, they compete, they fight, they train, they give their lives up uh, to this, to exemplify the best that we can uh, muster up in our activity. And, and to me, sometimes some of those activities out there on the mat are almost magical. To see somebody going through the air with such ease is incredible to me. I've competed at the world level, but in looking at today's athletes, my God, they're unusual people. They're, <laughs> I'd say this, they're freaks of nature in a sense but but still they exemplify the best that we have to offer and that didn't come about until the war was won and that war of course was a critical juncture that changed a lot of things i uh, i was really interested when he when lance was talking about the uh, and energyism, energism, uh, because that's that's a type of energy that's exhibited, and and uh, the energy that we exhibit today is of a sports nature. But let's just stop a second and think about this. Let's just stop a minute and say, how many people? How many people are being satisfied? How many people are being changed? How many people are being impacted uh, by the changes that came about? Yes, we all want to be the Olympic athlete, the one that that 10%. But if you look at the 90% that's out there, the 90% have gained an awful lot. And I don't think that that's a small feat. 
Kano actually did that. Kano started that. And the 90% is what most of the large judo organizations uh, concentrate on. And as far as the United States is concerned. US, so the, US so uh, the question is, uh, do you think you have positive or negative effect? Then I have another question after that. I, I, I think um, it's interesting li listening to Nishioka Sensei because he's absolutely right. Um, you know, the people who, who win the Olympic Games now from, you know, what Lance def defined as sport judo, they're, 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 they are icons, you know, kids kids in dojos across the world, you know, the boys want to be uh, Ono Shohei and, 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 the, and the girls want to be uh, Abe Uta. And, um, but what that does, that kind of icon type status, what it does is it encourages those kids to train. And it encourages them to step, step their toes into the water that Lance described as shugyo. And, and I genuinely believe that one of the that shugyo is a really, really important part of judo in, in terms of understanding um, its impact on, on your daily life. And then later starting to understand how you can use that to benefit society. And I think if, if people don't train hard, they, 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 they don't start to understand how it can impact on their life. And I think that the, um, the, the kind of role models that, that we get through, through the sports side of judo, I think are, are important, encouraging all of those kids, that 90%, encouraging those to visit dojos and encouraging them, you know, and, and getting some personal benefits from it, which is probably why their parents have taken them there in the first place. So. Okay, yeah, so the, the question, uh, if I may, uh, I have a question that says, uh, why the U.S. occupation didn't want judo practice the way it was? I think Lance. The, uh, yeah, that's for Lance. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the reasons I was able to find anything that nobody else was interested in. No one else had uncovered it. it was like, I was looking at things that no one else was interested in. I was a member of the, uh, literally of one of the organizations that's kind of a follow on to the occupation. So I could trace my military heritage back to the, to the guy who sat in the room with the Japanese and the Kendo people and said, we don't care what you do, but you're not gonna do what you did. And what they did, what they did was turn, what they, not Kanoshian, but the people who, um, ran the Ministry of Education, the Home Ministry, okay, which is all almost all powerful internal control mechanism. Um, what they did was over decades, and Khan Oshian was involved in the early days of this. Over many decades, they set up a mobilization system in Japan that was to train young men to be ready to be mobilized, and they would reduce the time it would take the army to induct a young man into service. So it was a constant battle between the war ministry, the imperial, mostly the imperial Japanese army, because the navy was seen as too technical, so they didn't bother with children. But the army wanted mass numbers of young men ready to go to combat. So there's this constant struggle between the army and the Ministry of Education over who would control many hours of the, uh, the curriculum for young men. So as the Army pushed to expand its strictly military training, it started to criticize martial arts and say, well, your martial arts is just a waste of time. What these guys need is more marching, rifle shooting, land navigation, map reading, stuff like that. But the response from people that, you know, these are, these were men, they were patriotic men, they, uh, and men to a man, they were all men, they weren't any women, uh, mm -hmm. except for teaching the, uh, the late young ladies, uh, Naginata, the, the response was to make Budo instruction more militaristic. So if I've collected all of the documents I can find regarding the wartime Judo instruction, so you have uh, four semesters, two years of judo, and they don't even th start to throw until the end of the fourth semester. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the, and the response of the people teaching judo and teaching budo and the Ministry of ed Education is to the Imperial Japanese Army is we will assist you in getting these guys ready for 
being drafted and military service. So the occupation looked at that and said, you're not going to do that anymore. We don't mind if you teach martial arts. In fact, we like martial arts. It's, it's a very strange thing. I actually tracked down and, and interviewed this lovely man who was like the last American alive in the room. Um, and he's, he's since passed away many years ago. But early on in my studies, I, I contacted him. We had this long dialogue. And he understood finally that he was being used by the Japanese Ministry of Education, which was trying to uh, set up a liberal regime with the kids and uh, the, the rightists who wanted to continue as they had. So the, so the occupation came down and said, look, martial arts is okay, but you're not gonna teach militaristic martial arts. You're not gonna use it to indoctrinate young people to do militaristic things. Well, when they took that away from Kendo, there was nothing left. So Kendo was on the outside for many uh, years. In fact, Kendo was never allowed back into the schools until the mid 50, after the occupation. But judo was allowed back into the schools at a relatively uh, early time. It didn't take them very long. And part of that was Kano's legacy at the top, where the Kodokan could present to the uh, occupation authorities that, in fact, uh, Kano was against all this militarist stuff, so we never got into that. What they didn't show was everybody below Kano who had jumped into it with both feet. And post-war, these are not things that you wanted to talk about because these people needed jobs. And think about it. This is, this is what they did for a living. They made a good living pre-war by being judo instructors. At post-war, they're out of a job. They can't teach. And the Budo Bam was in public facilities, including schools. So the Kodokan never shut down. In fact, two days after the occupation started, a young New Zealand squatty uh, infantryman shows up and said, I'd like to learn judo. And they said, uh, they ask you, do you have money? Goes, yeah, I got money. So, well, they were they were all for it because they were all out of a job, and this is why you get this 1950s wave of Japanese kind of some of them hardcore, but most of them just they didn't have anything else to do and they couldn't teach judo in Japan, so they went to England, they went to Europe, they went to the United States. In many instances, there were economic refugees of a sort. They lost their teaching certificates. So the only person I found post-war who owned up to this early on. Uh, was Tomiki Sensei of Aikido. He wrote, said, we did it. We did it on purpose. It was wrong and we were punished for it and we shouldn't have done it. But he was almost outcast because of it because no one had wanted to talk about this. If you read, it's, it's a remarkable recovery for judo. So was, what happened post-war is good and bad. If without the revamping of judo into a sport, I think it would be a niche martial art like Aikido. It would, it would have more of a spiritual appeal because I have been able to demonstrate that there's more solid spiritual philosophical basis to traditional judo than there is in any amount of Aikido. Mm -hmm. But it was completely abandoned post-war by the Kodokan because not everybody had incorporated it in their thought. You know, Kano Shiyama was on top saying, Seiryo Kuzinyo, and they got below there, you got some guy teaching the police and goes, well, let's just throw the guy and see how that works. <laughs> All right? So you got Aikido, which is kind of a hybrid between a little philosophy and the cooperation. It's not a sport. It's not a martial arts. Blah, blah, blah. I think the judo would be kind of like that with the if it had not turned into a giant sport. Now, is that better or worse? We don't know. But my hope now is that people will be elements of judo will start to understand that there is this basis. It could could be the basis of a great appeal to a number of people who see Japanese soft culture power. The, the idea of a, of a physical philosophy, the idea of a shortcut to Zen. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to appeal to everybody. But post-war, Judo did a remarkable thing. They named the son of Kano as the head of the International Judo Federation. Mm -hmm. And almost all of those people that voted for him had lost friends and family in World War II. It's a remarkable thing. It's a, it's a remarkable gesture of peace and goodwill. But what they were doing was sport judo. Now, kind of would have thought, well, this is kind of mixed bag. Um, but anyway, I go on to perhaps too long. That's my answer. So, uh, along a similar line, uh, how did the German emphasis on fitness through the spread of gymnasiums impact Kano Shihan's philosophy regarding exercise, diet, and healthy living? Can you ask that question again? Sure. How did the German emphasis 
on fitness through spread of gymnasium's impact, Kanoshi Han's philosophy regarding exercise, diet, and uh, healthy living. Uh, maybe my hearing isn't so good, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> which is true anyway. Uh, but but uh, here's the thing about, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about this idea of, uh, of physical exercise and the importance of it uh, that came about uh, from Kano's, um, uh, Kano's, I guess, his contribution to exercise. Uh, I think Kano wanted to have some kind of activity that uh, would be uh, multiplicity of, of, of things that, that could be held uh, in importance uh, from its practice. Uh, for example, one is health, another is uh, uh, self-protection, another one is, of course, uh, the finding out of what you're made of as you're practicing, whether you are going to be uh, brave and go to the practice, uh, whether you're going to be uh, tough-minded and keep going even if you get thrown, uh, whether you can survive uh, a lot of the uh, hard times that come about in life as we go through life. And these are all of the things that he contributed with German exercise, however, German exercises were gymnastic in nature. If you look at a lot of the activities that you find in, in the world of uh, physical activities, you, you don't find uh, something that has so many avenues of uh, going through and learning of, of certain things about yourself and uh, of bettering yourself as you do with judo. And uh, German exercises, mainly gymnastics, when it first came to the country in the uh, mid 1800s, it was, uh, they had some kind of uh, uh, German turnbrines, I think they called them. And uh, these are places to do exercise. If you look at that, of course, there's, a certain amount of uh, joy that you get from doing certain activities. That's the endorphins that flow in your body as you do certain, uh, certain activities, but, but nothing I don't think comes close to anything that you have uh, that is more spiritual in nature as Lance had pointed out for us uh, that we have in judo. Uh, there are some activities that may do that, but not purposefully, purposefully as part of your, the thing that you're learning about. We make a conscious effort when we have everybody bow at the beginning and at the end of practice. It's a physical act that kind of reverberates inside and says, you respect and these kinds of things are exemplified within the activity of judo that you don't find in every other sport. So we are very fortunate uh, to have that. As I was listening to Lance, of course, I want to just say this too, that I think Kano was quite an amazing man to have so many things. Uh, he was multilingual. He could speak Chinese. He could speak uh, German, he could speak English, he could speak Japanese. She's, I have a hard time just speaking English. But, you know, the, this, is a, this is an amazing man that had so many things going for him. And my friend said to me, he said, boy, uh, actually this guy was a student of mine, Earl Quinn Pridgen, he said, I think Kano is an amazing man because he did all these things and he still had time to have nine kids. <laughs> I 
that's a that's a that's a story in and of itself and uh, how, how little he saw those kids i mean kano was never around it, it was the old japanese school when he showed up they'd line him up on the sidewalk keep walking and they bow and, he, and one of his daughters said he walked right to his study we never saw him the rest of the day okay? so these were these were completely absent uh absent fathers they were almost not involved except for one daughter who's very interesting and um, she's actually in my presentation uh, she's the one who goes to the Kodokan and ends up heading the women's section. Uh, to, to, <laughs> to get into the uh, to get into the the nitty gritty of the question, it wasn't ger just the German gymnastics movement that was studied by the Japanese, and also the Czech Sokol movement, S O K O L. Uh, uh, the, the the big fight for Kano, and I remember that Kano is is uh, ends up being the head of the Tokyo Higher Normal School, which kind of unnoted in history today absorbs the. Taiso Jinshujo, which was the organization uh, the Japanese government had that actually evaluated martial arts for uh, inclusion in schools as the physical education for uh, schools. And everybody has a wrong idea about samurai, that they're out there practicing real hard doing the sword and everything else. It turns out the samurai were damn near worthless in a modern world. They refused to drill. Okay, so you got a modern army, it's all built on drill and mass formations and everybody doing stuff together. The samurai said, wait a minute, I've, I've got my certificate, I've got my menkyo, I don't need to drill, I've got proof, look, I'm, I'm a sword master, I don't need to go out there and wander around and march around. And they refused to do it, the commoners were doing it because there was a, there was a uh, three hots and a cot involved, I mean, they would actually get in there and, and do the drill, which, you know, by definition, they become much better. But in the early days of Japan, remember that the Japanese were importing most of their culture and their education systems. They sent people all over Europe, mostly Europe and the United States, but mostly Europe, to look at these nationalist uh, level movements, these physical education culture movements, and consciously adopted. There was a big fight. So the ones that went to Germany tended to like gymnastics. The ones that went to Eastern Europe tended to like the Sokol. Uh, the ones that went to Sweden came back with Swedish gymnastics, which was pri primarily the one adopted by the Ministry of Education was the Swedish gymnastics. And then the argument became for Kano, the question was whether uh, it would be militaristic, militaristic style gymnastics where you line everybody up, they've got a uh, uniform and they do all this stuff and they bow to the flag before they go, or you have a more civilianized version, even though the civilianized version to us today would be incredibly rigid and uh, regimented and uniform. Kano was on the side of more tuned to the individual and their interest and capabilities. Um, people, even people that work with him were very much for the militaristic uh, style gymnastics. The question was, which one? There was no question they're going to do something like that, and they did it. But the question was, which one they adopted? And they turned out not to be the German gymnastics. Does that make sense? I think they were very keen on swimming as well. I was talking to Sana de Sensei at Scuba, um, and he said that even nowadays at the University of Scuba, they have a, a swimming um, requirement once a year. Every student has to, uh, I'm not quite sure how far they have to swim, but but in Kano's day when he was leading that organisation, it was, it was much more regular, so I understand. So Kano Shahan <laughs> loves swimming. Mm. Let me put it that way. They, they, that uh, Kokshi magazine that I, I discussed, not only did it have a Sandow's method on weight training in every single edition, it, we went on and on about Sandow's method. They had a mm. much longer version on swimming. Uh, mm. They had There was an a, a appendix to every single one of those magazines. And Kano essentially developed Japan's new swimming method. He, he incorporated Western swimming and traditional swimming techniques. And he uh, came up with a new school of swimming that he was really upset that Japan didn't think it was really great. It never went much of anywhere, but as a, as a historical oddity, he tried to reinvent J Japanese swimming, taking the so, certain elements of Western swimming, like the crawl. The crawl yeah. is kind of unique to uh, Western uh, swimming. And then some of these uh, more esoteric Japanese swimming styles, which are which are designed so that someone can swim in the water and keep their musket out of the out of the water and wear armor and things like that. But he yeah, he was nuts about swimming. He was a great fan of the water. But I can't actually have I don't I don't have any record that he actually got in the water himself. So I've never quite understood that. Okay, so uh, this is for the panel again. Uh, 
what made Jigoro Kano an outstanding figure in Meiji Japan, or for that matter, even present day Japan? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my opinion is uh, what, what's really influential is um, the kind of political connections and network uh, that, that, that he had access to. Um, I mean, clearly a very intelligent man, as as, as uh, Nishio Kosenso has, has intimated. Um, uh, but I think uh, when you couple that with with the with the network possibilities, you know, Lance talks about uh, uh, sharing a sharing a desk. I think it was with the with the future prime minister and and that kind of thing. Um, because if you haven't got the networks, as we know today, you know, you, you can't create influence. And I think the, the legacy of Kano is because of his influence. Uh, and that requires those two things. It requires the intelligence, but it also requires the network. I think uh, Lance kind of uh, outlined some of the things that Kano did. I mean, th this is a man that was in the midst in the midst of the smartest people that were in Japan. And he was in a information catchment area where he could absorb all kinds of ideas, but the, but the, the fine point about Connell was that he was able to take this idea from one idea in politics attach it to another idea over here in physical education or in physical movement and combine them and say, hey, this is what we need. This is what we do in our society to make it better. These are the types of things that people that think, people that can coordinate their mental capacity to add things together, uh, can make life better for us. And that's what Kano did. He made life better for all of us. He put them, and the, and the clever thing that I think about all the time is the aphorisms that he play, play, planted into our system. The aphorisms, you know, Seiryoku Senryo, Jita Kyoe. Actually, there's one other one that I like, but I couldn't, yeah, it was told to me by my my stepfather Dan Oka, who who uh, used to read these judo books from Japan, and I might still have it in my garage somewhere if I can get to my garage. But it said "jiko no kansei." "Jiko no kansei" was self perfection, and those kinds of ideas he he put forth to us, and he gave us simple types of ways of thinking about things. And those are three of the more important ones. And then Lance came up with a couple of other ones that, that were just mind boggling to me. Jinsei no koro tada it's aru nori. Yeah, it's in our aru nori. Yeah. Boy, that. You know, there's only one journey of life. There's only one journey of life. That just about woke me up. When, when I read that, I went, oh my God, you only live one time. That's it. How are you going to spend it? It catches you and makes you think, I have to do the right thing. I have to try to get the best way to go. And that to me signal that that he was trying to make a better life for everybody he was a humanitarian in a sense and some may say well he was in the ministry uh, of education and he he controlled what types of things that the army even did but you know if you if you this is what my father translated my stepfather translated for me he said uh Jigo no kansei means self-perfection. And there was this other argument of if it's self-perfection, it's just about the self. How can you have 
mutual welfare and benefit. And then Bono answered, well, the way that you do that is think about it in a larger sense. If your country is going to war with another country, are you going to side and help the other country? And the answer is no, you can't. You have to, you have, home comes first. That was the idea. But when it's affordable, when it's a, when you're able to do it, share things bigger. And that I think uh, is something phenomenal. Just, uh, just those ideas. So that's, I think, Kano's contribution to us. Uh, not, just, not just the activity itself, although we get a lot from our activity. We feel good about it. Who doesn't feel good that you pick up someone, throw them on the ground, and they have nothing to say about it? I, I feel yeah. every time. I, I have that, that German word going through my head, schadenfreude. I'm yeah. happy you're sad. <laughs> so anyway, that's my thought on so, that. Along that line a little bit, um, how does the kind of thing that uh, uh, Kano Shihan was able to overcome the persuasive, per I'm sorry, pervasive anti-feudalism feelings in Japan at the time he established the Kodo Kanjido and be able to have it accepted within the culture at the moment of time. Well, um, I'll, I'll start off with that. I mean, um, Kano was born in the in the same year as the, as, as a major reformation, um, and uh, there's there's a great uh, image of the of the Emperor Meiji in, in court, and they're all wearing uh, Western dress, and it was a time when um, you know Japan was was looking outward, and it, and it started to be uh, you know unfashionable to uh, to be associated with with the old guys. Um, and and so I think it is it is uh, really interesting. Um, you know, we all know about the the stories about Kano being bullied as a as a young man, and and his his search for a sensei to try and uh, teach him various uh, jujitsu ryu and how difficult that was, and and so on. Um, but uh, but I think um, it you know it, it again it comes back to being in a position of influence. Uh, if if it, he could have been some some uh, some kid studying under a sensei and in 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 a in a, in a, um, in a back passage somewhere and 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 nobody would know about it and we wouldn't be talking about it you know 100 and something years later uh, it's because he was he was in a position of influence that he was able to take those ideas and and take them forward and particularly in his roles in education that Lance has, has uh, talked about. You know, if you're in a, speaking as somebody in, a, in an educational profession, you know, if you've got particular interests or something, you can interweave it into your, into your curriculum. You can influence people from, from, from that position. And if you, if you happen to be very well connected in the upper echelons of society, you can, your, your reach can reach even further. Um, so those those are some of my initial thoughts on that on that topic. One of the um, aspects of Kano that I think is underappreciated today is uh, is the fact that he was born into a commoner family. He was not born into an upper class family. He he lived in a village outside Kobe, uh, what became Kobe City, and as I mentioned. In the Edo era, they did not have a daimyo. They had a bugyo. They had a, a government administrator who looked after everything. And they had very close scrutiny from the government because of the cash, sake, tax revenue. So they had a very close connection with the people collecting the money. Now, when the major restoration comes around, all those people didn't go away. They started working for the new government because somebody still needed to uh, collect the taxes and they knew where, where the money was. So they didn't fire everybody who was associated with the old regime. They took out the head. And in fact, some Japanese call it a coup. It, wasn't, it was a coup d'etat, a coup of the state, a blow to the state, not to the mechanism. Kano's father lived in Edo. 
he was he was closely associated with the government. And they had a monopoly to ship sake to Edo, to because politicians, being politicians, they're thirsty. They drank a lot of sake, and most of it came from Kano's family and the associated uh, sake mm-hmm. breweries down in near Kobe. Um, if Kano had stayed in Kobe, it would be another small school of jujitsu today. But when he his when his mother died, the father brought the entire family, and I don't think he ever lived with the father. He father was constantly putting him out boarding school or go to this school. When he went to the Taisei Gakko, the, the government language uh, prep prep school, Kano's father arranged for him to live with the headmaster. I mean, but so this is the sort of connection that they had because of money, power, influence, position, uh, not not from the traditional daimyo side, but from the actual rubber meets the road, here comes the new Japan. Kano graduates from the University of Tokyo and gets right in the middle of it, uh, of building this educational system that would fuel the imperial empire later. I found one of the senior judo guys in the 1941, when things were going swimmingly for the Japanese, he said, we're able to field this army because of the education system Kano Shihan put together and the splendid product that it is. But when Kano started, there were, there were very few people doing jujitsu, very few b- people doing kinjutsu. So he was, he, was cult- he was recruiting out of his own family. So you see his cousins and little brothers and everything. Uh, not little brothers, he didn't have one. But anyway, he had cousins and associates. And he, but, the, but the Kano Juku, the private school, started before the dojo. Parents went to him and said, I want my son to get into the gakushuin. I want you to teach him the entrance exam. He started the massive Japanese industry of the Juku, the private cram school, where the teachers come out of the school and they teach the kids what's going to be on the test to get to the next level. He started it. And they're all over Japan. So he was able to recruit some very influential people. And he carefully noted uh, every every person that entered, he noted whether they were uh, Kazoku from the, uh, the former nobility, Shizoku, former samurai, or Heimi, they're commoners. He very carefully noted them, and he recruited their parents. They got money from their parents to support. So they they kind of tinkered along into the Sino-Japanese War. And what everybody doing martial arts did was relate Budo, at at the time, Bujutsu, martial arts, Jujutsu and Kinjutsu, to patriotism. And therefore, the demand for their services went through the roof, particularly in Edo particularly, sorry, Tokyo. Uh, so the feudalism kind of burned out and everybody was fed up with the feudalism. The, the former samurai wanted their kids to learn how to do martial arts. And then commoners wanted to be more patriotic and show their patriotism by doing something that they thought was militaristic. And all of a sudden Japanese martial arts became more militaristic. Make sense? And that's how they... They cared, the momentum built from that started the Sino-Japanese War, 1894-95, the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905, and it, and, it, and it accelerated from there. And after that, he was able to get it into the school proper. So Kano was a great organizer. He wasn't, uh, I'm not sure he was a great inventor. He was a great organizer. So he would go into a town, he'd, he'd take a uh, Ministry of Education business and go to a city, and he'd go look up all the jujitsu instructors, and he'd say, you're really good. You're so good, I'm going to make you a sandan in Kodokan Judo. Here's a Kodokan Judo book. Here's a rule book for the Shi'ai. We're going to come back later, and we're going to invite you to Tokyo. Bring your kids to Tokyo for a tournament. And all of a sudden, these guys who had kind of languished in uh, you know, living hand to mouth in, the, in their little city became part of his broader network. Now, if you didn't sign up, he was kind of like the board. You know, you either get assimilated or we're going to blow you up. And all of a sudden, if you, if you run the rules, if you control the rules, you control the outcome, the outcome became Kodokan Judo. Within a generation, most of the jujitsu schools had disappeared. Why? There's only so many hours in a day and very few children uh, in school are going to do judo and then turn around and change all the rules and do jujitsu. It's just not gonna happen. So these guys, in order to survive and expand their practices and become associated with Kodokan Judo, which was constantly uh, proselytizing, advertising, sending people around, they accepted Kano's promotion and they became Kodokan Judo people. He did the same thing with Gunji Koizumi in uh, England, 
promoted him on the spot. You're my guy now. Yeah, straight to second down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think you've, you've hit on something else there, Lance, which is around um, Kano's innate feel for marketing, um, for want of a better word. You know, there's all these matches that happened in the 1880s against all these other jiu-jitsu ryu, um, but the ones, the ones that got the, the, that made it to the press, shall we say, are the ones where Kodokan Judo won. Uh, so they didn't win all the all those jujitsu room matches at all, but the ones that they did win, they marketed very heavily. So yes. I think, you know, really smart man, really smart man. So there's, here's one of the dangers I point out to the historic study of judo. There are no contemporary records of those things happening. Okay. Almost, almost all of those descriptions come from a, a series of interviews that Kano gave a guy named uh, Ochiai. Uh, a, a judo instructor named Ochi, and they show up in Judo Magazine, and it's Kano, almost 30 years, after, more than 30 years after the fact, giving his version of what happened, and there are no contemporary records of that actually happening. What actually happened was that there were some small police matches, and the police hired a number of jujitsu instructors, including competitors to the Kodokan. So if you read Kano's version, they won the war, they became the judo instructors. No. What actually happened, and I have records of this, where they were hiring, in fact, uh, Tanabe Sensei of Fusenryu, the, the Newa as a specialist, gets hired at the same time that Isogai and some other guys get hired by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, which play a huge role in the modernization of Budo. Because they're big, they've got money, it's, it's one of the biggest police forces uh, in history. And they have uh, a requirement to train more and more standardized Bujutsu Kano saw that and he started sending his people over there, getting them hired. And that way he was able to, once again, through the influence of you, you control the rules, you control the outcome, he would get the Kodokan rules incorporated into the, into the uh, matches, which previously were kind of a negotiation between the dojo head and they could vary all over the place. Uh, but more, the more and more it became standardized, he could point and say, see, the country is standardizing on Kodokan Judo. You should adopt Kodokan Judo in the schools. You should adopt it in the military. You should adopt it in the police. And that's eventually what happened is in essence. So along with that, there's an interesting question here. Um, how do we highlight Judo outside the dojo and, and to our students? Uh, so do, you say, do, do you mean um, how, how do we get the, the, the children in the dojo to, to engage in judo in their daily life? Is, is that, is that the, the nub of the question? That's part of it, but it, the question is how do we highlight judo uh, outside the dojo? You know, I think right now, uh, I'm speaking about United States. Um, our uh, judo population isn't that big, and it's important to advertise. It's important to show uh, some of the uh, kids. You know, there's a real interesting sport that you could in, engage in. So, uh, one of the, the things that uh, we always talk about is how do we advertise? How do we take the message to the the the, the environment that we live in to bring in new students? Well, that's a complicated uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you know you guys have this uh, uh, PhD behind your title. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, low blow. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's some there's some really really smart um, marketing that's gone on around the world. You know, if you're going if you're talking about USA Judo trying to increase its population base. Um, that, that you know nowadays it it, it it's all about uh, using the media effectively and and, and bringing judo through the media to the masses um, and uh, you know you don't need to lose the values in order to do that in fact you need to enhance the values and, and really sell those um, but uh, you know there's examples for example the the German judo federation used a cartoon character called Kim Possible um to emphasize those values i mean the, the work of the french judo federation is is you know is legendary 
Um, so there are plenty of president, presidents of federations globally that would be able to tell you what's worked for them and what hasn't. Yeah. Well, I think um, one of the advantages that Connell had was that he had a lot of friends and a lot of people that he knew. And he had this idea that if I teach one person, that one person goes out and teaches a thousand persons. If I have 20 of those, that's 20,000. That's pretty good. That idea was good. That's what he actually used uh, to spread judo. And that's probably what we have to do too uh, in, in the United States. I think we have a very good product. Judo is an amazing, an amazing activity. Uh, we just have, we even have the right teachers to do it. We just have to believe in ourselves and then go out and do that. And I think we'll do a better job at it as we have confidence in ourselves and, and we do it. Uh, this confidence, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, energyism again, because it's kind of related uh, uh, to this idea of of uh, self-perfection, I guess, you know, you wanna to try to perfect yourself. This was, I guess, during the war excluded because it was too personal, too selfish of a person to say, I'm gonna improve myself. I'm gonna improve my own country in a sense too at, at the same time. So they wanted to exclude that, calm that down, and then think in terms of, uh not emphasizing the the self-perfection portion of of judo but i think that's a portion that we have to remember uh, and it comes back into importance probably it started back into importance during the 1980s 1990s with a person by the name of abraham maslow and abraham maslow have these areas that were developmental. It's a developmental pyramid, it's called. And at the bottom, he says people are uh, interested in food, shelter, clothing. The second part uh, is of love, love of, of your loved ones and, and those that are around you. And the third one is uh, you start to go to self-esteem, try to find this area where you can try to uh, get some self-esteem of yourself. So you're saying, oh, you do a nice osotogari. Oh, you do a nice seonage. Oh, the, the position that you take is really nice. That's, that's giving self-esteem to the student. But self-actualization is at the top of the pyramid. Self-actualization is about the self. And we have to be aware of what we are, what we go for, and uh, what we make of ourselves at the very top. It's almost, almost uh, dealing with religion in a sense. It's almost going into that area uh, of, of energyism and of directing the energy rather than the use of energy, but directing it uh, much like almost like Zen Buddhism in a sense, uh, Satori, Nirvana, those kinds of images come to mind. But uh, these are things we do uh, with other people, and, and we when we deal with other people, this is how we can make our judo better. I hope that uh, can influence other people by having good friends. I'm gonna end with a little story here. Uh, it's about an eagle. And this eagle lays an egg and the egg rolls down. Luckily, it doesn't crack. And it rolls down to a farm where a chicken sees it and says, oh, one of my eggs came out of the, out of the basket and wings it over, throws it into the basket, sits on it, hatches it and out pops this eagle. Eagle's never seen himself. He just looks around and says, oh, there's chicks around. Oh, I must be a chick. 
and he starts pecking at food and then and he gets a little hungry he goes outside he looks up in the sky sees his brothers and sisters flying amongst the, amongst the clouds and goes oh my god look at that how beautiful that is i wish i could be like that every day it happens like that every day he says oh i should i wish i could do that why 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 am I like this, you know? And then one day he comes out, he's emaciated and he dies. That's the end of the story. And you say, is that it? Well, the moral of the story is you hang around chickens, you'll be a chick. You hang around eagles, you may be able to fly. And what we have to do is we have to fly we have to go out and say, we can fly. We have to stick around people that can fly. Stick around people like Mike, stick around people like Lance, stick around people like Kenji, stick around people that you admire. And I think we can do a damn good job. That sounds really great. Um, so along with that, uh, the panel have any suggestions or suggested resources for judo kind of wanting to know more about true nature of judo practice? Well, I, uh, I had seen that question before, so I made sure that uh, I brought this book with me. Well, you can't see with my, so this one, which is, um, the, this book is a, um, it's a translation, um, of a book that was prepared for the 150th anniversary of uh, the birth of Kano. So it was written in Japanese in uh, 2010, 2011 for the 150th anniversary uh, edition. Um, and in uh, 2019 or 2020, it was, uh, there was an English translation produced. Um, yeah, it's uh, f for me, um, until I met Lance, this was probably the, uh, the you know, the best source of information on uh, understanding of, 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 uh, of Kano. I have a couple of uh, uh, recommendations. One is if you can get it, if you can get it, this is really hard to get. Um, Michelle Bruce and David Matsumoto wrote a book for the uh, for the American public, and also a smaller version for uh, the international group uh, for the IJF. They wrote this book on the history of judo. And if you can get that, that's a good starter. That's a good starter. But looking into people's minds, looking into people's thinking, uh, understanding why we do certain things. Oh my God, these two guys that are right here on the side here, Mike and uh, Lance, they're the experts, they're the researchers. And this is what we need. I, I'm just a talker, I read about these guys. I read from them and I take from them and try to put things together and understand things. But these are the guys that really do the work. So these, my hat's off to them. No hat, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. There's also um, there's also this book, which is the um, uh, again, it's not it's not working very well on my screen, but um, uh, the Coda can produce this, um, and it's the third chapter uh, of a book that was produced in 1964 uh, to commemorate the uh, the Olympic Games. Um, uh, the innovative response to modernization, and that's that's uh, kind of uh, Kodakan position on uh, on various aspects. But what what I particularly like about about Lance's approach is that he's gone, yeah, that's fine, but I want to look beyond that, you know. So um, as as he said, you know, going to the National Diet Library, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Most people. If they're serious about this, they, they get as far as the Kodakan Library, and, and that's about as far as it goes. Whereas, uh, you know, what we've managed to hear today from Lance is is a step beyond, which is which is why it's uh, so important. That uh, that one you just held up is by Dr. Alex Bennett, who's probably the ranking uh, 
non-Japanese kendoka in the world. He he uh, had some friends at the Kodokan. He actually translated that. I did the yeah, final. Did, yeah. I, I did the final read and edit on that. Okay. Um, he he uh, he boiled down a lot of incredibly repetitious stuff. So those two book the, books that you mentioned also, uh, Judo Memoirs of Kano Jigoro um, by Brian Watson, an Englishman living in Japan who took years to translate those articles that I talked about, those uh, semi-autobiographical interviews with Ochi uh, Torazo, a Judo guy who, who was writing for Judo Magazine, which Kano um, edited. They're completely unsupported, but they are they are core to understanding how Kano wanted to present judo to the world. Uh, some of them are just simply fabrications. Uh, I've been able to demonstrate that some of them he just he just made up. Remembering this is a this is a sixty year old man who's retired, and all of a sudden he's talking about what he did in the you know as a twenty two year old. And like most of us, I'll just say his memory did not match the reality. Uh, but it's critical to understand how he wanted judo presented to the world by using his own words. And, and Brian Watson has done a tremendous job. It's, it's published by a small house in uh, uh, the UK is still available in new, in new print today. It, it must be in everybody's library. So uh, can I ask you guys to uh, uh, give us a title and the authors and uh, go ahead and email it to... Uh, uh, key, and then we could uh, post it for uh, everybody's uh, information. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Sure, no problem. Yeah, those yeah. those three, uh, all three are in print now, I believe. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, you get a, you can get into the technology of you know the uh, various tech uh, technical sides and everything else. But to understand what we're talking about, uh, those three are critical. And, and anything on my website, <laughs> which is which is which has never seen the light of day. Trust me. Well, and also uh, Nishioka Sensei mentioned um, uh, judo for the U.S. by uh, by by David and Michelle. Um, very very important book. Before we forget, uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Keith Keith Chu who uh, headed up this project and uh, did a, a bang up job. And a lot of the people that they're in the background, they're there, you don't see them, but uh, they're the ones that did all the work and getting the uh, graphics up, getting some of the uh, uh, program going, uh, coming to the meetings that, that we had uh, uh, to get this ready. Uh, and this includes Kenji, of course, uh, they they also uh, uh, did a bang up job, and I want to thank them for that. Yeah, I, I echo that. Uh, there's so many people that behind this thing that uh, really worked hard to put this thing together, and especially you know speaking for me, uh, I would not be on uh, the Zoom without Mike Krulinski helping me to get a, uh, a computer that has camera because mine doesn't work. So <laughs> I don't want to thank all the people that put this thing together. And I want to thank the uh, thank, uh, Colonel and uh, the panel. Uh, I think wealth of information was passed. There's so much more uh, question that I would like to ask, but uh, due to time, we don't have a lot. Uh, and what I like to do is, um, I'm sure we're getting a lot more chat questions, but I also would like to publish that after we're uh, finished. Uh, and with that, I have a question uh, for Lance. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the more interesting discoveries you made about Jigoro Kano? There's a, there's a very long list of <laughs> facts about Kano Shihan that at, at first just blew me away. I, I was very surprised uh, by the range of his activity and the depth of his activity and things that had nothing to do with judo. Um, and as sort of a meta discovery of that, 
But I have to ask a question, uh, which I can't really answer. Did he even teach judo? <laughs> because this is a man who was, uh, by the time he retires in 1920 from the Ministry of Education, his position as the principal of the Tokyo Higher Normal School, which becomes Scuba University. It's one of the one of the core uh, elements of Scuba University, and it's the it's not just a high school. People misunderstand it. It's the teachers college for the empire. It's just that it had not been promoted to university level, which he tried for most of his career to make happen. But by the time he retired in 1960, he's on the board of all these things. In two years, he becomes a member of the upper house. And he's not on a backbencher. He's, he's in the most powerful element of the upper house at the direct request of the prime minister, who's a friend of his. And all of the things he gets involved in that, that even Japanese don't pay attention to. So Kano's activities in education, uh, athletics, the Olympics, and judo were pretty well documented. In fact, I would, I would hesitate to try to do anything else. But outside of that, his political and strategic activities are, are stunning. That would be an accomplishment for anybody. But sort of dawned on me, and, and I didn't go into this with any ideas because I started discarding everything I knew and, and ignoring most of everything written about Kano. To, to Bill from the beginning. And I really wonder how much he taught judo. I don't think he taught judo much at all. I think it, it, his uh, key instructors, people that he had literally brought in in some instances from horse stables and uh, street urchins and rickshaw boys. These were the kind of flotsam and jetsam of modern Japanese life. He brought these people in, gave them room and board and an education and gave many of them a lifetime livelihood of teaching judo they're the people who came up with judo but they weren't about to counter his version of events but it's pretty clear to me that when someone says well i was kano's direct student they meant i was in the dojo when kano wandered through and gave a couple of instructions and sat his you know his fat little legs on this chair that was always on the stand uh, it's it's very unlikely he he taught much judo at all. He broke his broke uh, collarbone was severely broken during randori with Yokoyama, who who somebody, sometimes you wonder if he did it on purpose. Uh, and he never did randori again. In fact, uh, going back to these pictures, I was giving hints to people to see if anybody would come up with it. The question is, why is Kano wearing a, a judo gi at, at 70 years old? That's what the inscription says. Because he took, he never put on a judo gi again, except for that picture. Um, at, after 60, he wore hakama exclusively and would wander around the dojo. He, but he quit practicing, uh, he, he quit demonstrating randori in his 30s after he broke his collarbone. Um, so once again, he, he is the spark plug. He is the organizer. He is the great mind behind this expansion and incredibly uh, stubborn and egotistical man let me put it that way if he one of his uh, contemporaries said if he won he was happy if he lost you never heard the end of it he was the most stubborn man in japan this is a guy that had worked with him for decades and thought a great deal of him so there are a lot of people who didn't think a great deal of kano shiha even inside judo so what uh, what's striking to me is, is how rich this man's life was, how, how many things he touched in his uh, very long life, despite the fact of being very ill for much of his life. He had, he had chronic diabetes and had many problems. In, in modern days, he probably would have had one or, more, one or both of his legs amputated years before. So he was in very poor physical health. And yet he, he went on when his doctors said, uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, you don't need to travel. He, he left people behind and traveled by himself, traveled the entire world. And it ended up killing him because he dies of probably diabetic induced uh, pneumonia on his ship in 1938. So uh, it's, it's just the totality of the life of this man and his drive to do things. And he embodies this notion of energism, uh, the best use of energy, uh, putting yourself to work, working hard on things, uh, devoting yourself. He constantly uses the term, uh, which means to exhaust yourself. 
in physical exercise and uh, mental exercise in your activities in society, but doing it in a nice way, uh, pushing yourself as hard as you can to get good things done for yourself and for society. I'll um, I'll challenge you, Lance, in the in the um, in the best spirit of a of a nice uh, randori. So um, you say that Kano didn't didn't teach judo, but there are four ways to teach judo, which is uh, randori, kata, mondo, and kogi. So I'm I'm sure he I'm sure he taught judo with at least two of those four methods. Correct, uh, and this is a this is a greatly underappreciated thing. Um, I'm I'm working on a separate paper or a series of papers looking at his speeches, uh, which were which are mostly interminable. You can actually find pictures, photos of him giving a lecture. Um, and, and you hear, I read tales of people like, you know, they're comatose at the end of, uh, end of his discussions, how long they are. He loved to talk, is very repetitious. Uh, and he'd put people to sleep. I mean, because frankly, there's only so much that people can handle. So this is one of the great challenges of, of taking any of this and incorporating it into modern judo. How much can you do? I mean, we probably, you know, we've talked for two hours and we probably lost three, three fourths of the audience already. I mean, how do you, how do you bring this brilliant stuff and make it into a little diamond instead of the kind of scattered uh, things that we have now? I don't have any answers there. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep uh, panning for little flecks of uh, gold and let somebody else figure this out. Great. Um, I think most, uh, most of the audience is still here and uh, interested in uh, learning a lot more. But, uh, I think uh, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, end this uh, session. Uh, I really appreciate all of your input. I, I learned a lot. I learned a whole lot. And uh, uh, a lot of the information I had, a little twist, uh, a more truthful uh, information that I I will be passing to my students, but uh, thank you gentlemen for uh, participating. I really appreciate it. And again, from Nanka Judo, Yudan Shikai, thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks. And by thank the way, you. my name is not Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for your attention and all the uh, helpful comments. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone.